Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas was released in 1998 to a reception it would be fair to call mixed. Reflecting the polarizing nature of the source material, the film drew a mixed to moderate response from film critics as the adaptation of the cult classic book was seen at the time as unconventional and niche, meaning the movie would hold limited appeal to the mainstream. Terry Gilliam's directorial vision, however, was a perfect match for the psychedelic chaos of Hunter S. Thompson's words. The screen comes alive with a kaleidoscope of colors, distorted perspectives, and mind-bending visuals as Gilliam brought Thompson's prose to life by injecting it with a potent dose of anarchic energy and madness. At the heart of this cinematic whirlwind is Johnny Depp's transformative performance as Raoul Duke the alter ego of Thompson himself. Depp captures the essence of Duke's manic energy, his unyielding pursuit of the ultimate high, and his unfiltered observations of the world around him. With every twitch, every wild gesture, Depp immerses himself in the character, embodying the spirit of Thompson, or rather, Duke. Thompson was an American journalist, author, and cultural icon known for his distinctive writing style and fearless approach to journalism. He pioneered a form of immersive participatory journalism called gonzo journalism, which blurred the lines between subjective storytelling and objective reporting. Thompson's work was characterized by his sharp wit, biting social commentary, and unapologetic criticism of American politics and society. He was known for his wild and unconventional lifestyle, often immersing himself in the subcultures and events he covered. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, one of his most famous work, exemplifies his unique style, blending personal experiences, drug use, satire, and social critique. Thompson's writing style is characterized by a stream-of-consciousness approach, capturing the erratic and often disjointed thoughts and experiences of the protagonist while staying true to Thompson's own unique perspective on reality. After his trip was over and Thompson returned, he spent a significant amount of time editing and revising his notes and recordings. He wove them together to create a coherent narrative while maintaining the raw and spontaneous nature of the events he experienced. The first part of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, A Savage Journey to the Heart of the American Dream, was published in the November 11, 1971 issue of Rolling Stone. The author's name, and that of the narrator within the story, was Raoul Duke. Thompson's writing was infused with a sense of rebellion and a deeply held disdain for authority. His observations and criticisms often focused on the hypocrisies and absurdities he saw in American society, politics, and the media. His fearless and irreverent approach challenged traditional journalistic norms and made him an influential figure for generations of writers and journalists. The story follows Mr. Duke and his eccentric attorney, Dr. Gonzo, as they embark on a road trip to Las Vegas. Through their adventures, the two psychonauts encounter bizarre characters, uncanny situations, and consume lots and lots and lots and lots of mind-altering substances. It's a crazed voyage as the pair rampage through the desert city, strung out around the clock on mescaline, LSD, cocaine, ether, and booze. In a city where mere possession of marijuana can get you 20 years in prison, the pair overdose before they even check into the hotel. The text is a severely critical social commentary that lays bare the corruption, hypocrisy, and spiritual bankruptcy of American society in the 1970s. It exposes the darker side of the American dream, where idealism is replaced by greed, and the pursuit of happiness devolves into a desperate search for escape from a world gone mad. Beyond his work as a writer, Thompson became a recognizable symbol known for his distinctive appearance, including his signature cigarette holder, aviator sunglasses, and flamboyant fashion choices. He left an indelible mark on American literature and journalism, leaving a legacy as a provocative and boundary-pushing writer who pushed the limits of storytelling and spoke truth to power. The work, along with several other Thompson stories, had been previously adapted for cinema with director Art Lindzen's where the Buffalo Rome, released in 1980, starring Bill Murray as Thompson. 
Murray immersed himself in the character so deeply that when Saturday Night Live started its fifth season, Murray was still in character as Thompson, with one of the show's writers telling the press that, quote, in a classic case of the role overtaking the actor, Billy returned that fall to Saturday Night Live so immersed in playing Hunter Thompson, he had virtually become Hunter Thompson, complete with long black cigarette holder, dark glasses, and nasty habits. Billy was not Bill Murray, he was Hunter Thompson. You couldn't talk to him without talking to Hunter Thompson. In 1989, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas was almost first made by Gilliam when he was given a script by illustrator Ralph Steadman. Gilliam, however, felt that the script didn't capture the story properly. In 1995, Gilliam received a different script he felt was worth realizing. Director Alex Cox was slated to direct, and Johnny Depp had been attached in principle to the role. Cox would later upset Thompson and see himself removed from the project. Removed quite literally, in fact. Gilliam then brought the novel to life in a way that only he could. From the very beginning, Gilliam knew that he needed to immerse himself in Thompson's world to truly grasp the essence of the story. He spent significant time with Thompson, exploring the intricate details of the novel, which allowed Gilliam to not only understand the story on a surface level, but also to tap into the raw energy that permeated Thompson's work. Gilliam's direction infused the film with a vivid and hallucinatory atmosphere, perfectly capturing the drug-induced haze and distorted reality that the characters experienced. He utilized a variety of techniques, including a great many irrationally fantastic visuals, animated sequences, and rapid-fire editing to create a cinematic language that mirrored the frantic nature of the story. Gilliam's signature visual style, characterized by exaggerated and dreamlike imagery, perfectly complemented Thompson's prose. Gilliam's attention to detail was evident in every frame of the film. The production design captured the essence of the 1970s with its vibrant colors, outlandish costumes, and intricate set pieces. The meticulous recreation of the Circus Circus Hotel and Casino, where much of the story takes place, added an additional layer of authenticity to the film. In 1996, as Depp was in New York completing his work on the set of Donnie Brasco, he got a phone call from Thompson asking him if he would be interested in playing him in the film version of Fear and Loathing. Depp replied, of course I would. The pair spoke at length, and the subject was never raised again for quite some time. His agent and lawyers didn't want him to do it, but Depp stayed the course and was committed for the long haul. Depp recounts his early self-doubt, saying, quote, I was in New York, I think for the 25th anniversary party for Fear and Loathing, and I cornered Hunter and asked him if he really wanted me, if he really felt I was the guy to do that, because I knew he had other friends who were actors, and I would have been more than happy to back out. It was Hunter's book, and if it was going to be me, I needed to have his blessing. And he said, no, of course you're wanted. You have my blessing. I said... If I do a remotely decent job of portraying you, you know there's a very good chance you'll hate me for the rest of your life. And he said, well, then let's hope for your sake that I don't. Johnny Depp's first encounter with Hunter S. Thompson was when he was invited to the Woody Creek Tavern in Colorado in December of 1994. A friend asked Depp to come down and meet Hunter for a drink or two. Depp took up the invitation and waited at the tavern. The door sprang open, and in marched Thompson holding a three-foot cattle prod and a taser gun. These were what Thompson labeled as his just-in-case weapons. Thompson and Depp then shook hands, and from that moment the two became forever friends. They connected on the level of both being from Kentucky, both having checkered pasts in their youth, and both men sharing a great love of literature. Depp was invited to Thompson's house that night. And once settled, the pair would shoot targets with Thompson's nickel-plated 12-gauge shotgun before building a DIY bomb from propane and nitroglycerin to fire into the sky. Depp considered this a rite of passage, and the two were bonded from here on in. The only thing that Depp knew that he wanted, that he says he quote-unquote needed, was the years of 1970 and 71, the Vegas time, and Hunter's relationship with Oscar Acosta, the model for Dr. Gonzo. 
That was the initial focus, but as the friendship was established, the pair discussed everything in detailed, night-long conversations. From Thompson's earliest memories, his youth in Louisville and beaning people's mailboxes and petty thievery, and his Air Force days. Depp asked to videotape the conversations, not as an interview, but just as material to help him prepare. Depp says, quote, And neither one of us, by the way, looked at the camera after that. We just sat and talked for hours and hours and hours. I have endless amounts of footage of that, which was very, very helpful. Depp then began to break the fibers of Thompson's behavior and mannerisms down to a subatomic level, bordering on obsession. He wanted to act as a sponge and absorb Thompson's intrinsic nature for a performance that he intended to go beyond mere mimicry and fanboy imitation. He became fascinated with these small details. For example, the way that Thompson would approach a meal. The meal would arrive, and Thompson would then sort of study it before salt and peppering it for 20 minutes. He'd squeeze a whole lemon over everything he ate. Depp recounted the experience of shadowing Thompson following the film's release, saying, quote, If I have a favorite period with Hunter, it would most definitely be when I was living with him in his basement in the spring of 97. We were like a couple of roommates. I went on to Hunter's hours. We'd go to sleep about 9 or 10 in the morning and be up for breakfast at about 7 p.m. He took care of me. He made sure that I ate. The things people know and believe about Hunter, his savage approach to life and this irreverent, beautiful, poetic demeanor, are all true. But when I was with him at his house, just sitting in his kitchen chatting and watching sports, he was a very gentle guy. Hyper. Hypersensitive. Hence the self-medication. I was of the mind where I knew the wrong thing to do was to try to keep up with Hunter in any capacity. There was one time when I wanted to do some hallucinogens with him, and it was LSD-25, and he actually stopped me. He just said, look, man, it's very powerful, and it's a two-day commitment. Are you ready for that? I said, I'm not so sure. Maybe, maybe not. And he said, I suggest that you wait. He was very cautious about things like that. Whatever his intake was, was his intake, but if you were prepared to go that extra mile, he would stop you just to make sure. He knew I worshipped him, and I know that he loved me, so he may have been part father figure, part mentor, but I'd say the closest thing is brothers. We were like brothers. Depp eventually moved out to Woody Creek and lived in Thompson's basement, which Thompson forever after called Johnny's room. Depp was given permission and open access to go through Hunter's files and unearth original notes and scribbles related to fear and loathing. Depp even dug up Thompson's clothes from the period so he could dress just as Hunter did. Depp explored the Hunter S. Thompson archives, aka the War Room. It was here that Depp found three 1971 boxes simply marked The Vegas Book, which was what Thompson would always refer to fear and loathing as. Inside the boxes, everything from the era had all been saved. The literature from the drug convention, napkins with notes on them, the purloined bars of Neutrogena soap that no one had touched since 1971, and the three beat-up stained spiral notebooks in which Thompson had scribbled his observations. Depp says, quote, There's much more. The notebooks and the actual manuscript, it's more insane than the book. It's toned down. It was probably more outrageous and more insane than he can write. I think the book is a calmer version of what actually happened. Depp copied the notebooks, taped their conversations to study, and Thompson even let Depp take the Red Shark, the Chevy convertible that features in the film, back to Los Angeles. Director Gilliam would comment on Depp's intense preparation, saying, quote, Johnny was amazing. He was like some kind of vampire. Each time, he'd come back with more of Hunter's clothes and things. He was stealing Hunter's soul, really, secretly, which Hunter was apparently quite happy to go along with. Just prior to the final time Depp visited Woody Creek, he had shaved the top of his own head to resemble Thompson's. Depp shaved his head to turn himself into a Thompson look-alike. He said it looked ridiculous, but that it was important to get into Thompson's mind. It was observed by Depp's assistant that he would jump into his Hunter character at any given second. The way he held a cigarette, and the way he picked up Hunter's walk. Depp would imitate Thompson to the point the Gonzo legend would make him stop because it freaked him out too much. 
When Thompson inspected Depp's baldness, they both agreed that the haircut hadn't gone nearly far enough, and that Thompson would do it himself. Depp says, quote, Hunter looked at my head and decided, I can fix this. I trusted him, I really did. He was very gentle. No cuts, no weirdness. He wore a mining light so he could see. He's prepared for everything. Once Depp had pulled off the look, the hair, the cadence, the clothes, the posture, the voice, the walk, and the actions, all that was left now was accurately depicting Thompson's ears. Throughout filming, Depp wore earpieces behind his ears to make them stick out at the required angle. Depp says, It hurt, too. It really hurts. Don't put anything behind your ears. Don't try this at home, kids. There were a few differences of opinion initially. Shortly before filming began, Depp faxed to Colorado wardrobe test photographs of himself as Thompson. Thompson faxed them back, defaced, with comments bluntly criticizing the clothing, scrawling, Clothes all wrong, ugly, screwy, flashy, the hair looks like mange, and the body language is too exaggerated. Thompson then sent Depp a message that read, quote, Okay, go ahead and make an ass of me on the screen. Your turn will come, and history will not absolve you. Beware. Depp was unsure if Thompson was raging, or joking, or both, or neither, and promptly sent back the following correspondence, quote, Hunter, Please know that I'm not in any way, one, trying to make an ass of you in the film, two, turn you into some over-the-top caricature, three, screw you over in some kind of cartoony way, four, treat this material like an episode of the Red Skeleton Show, and five, disappoint you or anything close to any of those things. I am doing my best to combine pieces of you, the you of today that I've gotten to know, the you that I've studied from some of the older video material, and the character from the book, Raoul Duke. He continues saying, We are at the beginning of this hideous ride and things are just starting to take shape, only starting, so don't freak out. Give it and me a chance. The wardrobe is not where it needs to be yet and I want your help with it. Understand that I'm not a scumbag and that all I want out of this thing is for you to be proud of the work and the film. Nobody's getting rich here, believe me. I'm an actor and can only do what I can do. I am not and cannot be you, but I can come pretty close and will. This is my work. If you remember back about a year or so ago, I asked you if you were sure that I should be the actor to play you in the film. Your reply was yes. Well, it was at that point that I told you that if I was able to do it properly and did even a remotely good job or accurate portrayal, that you would most likely hate me for the rest of your life. That is the risk I run here. And okay, fine, I'll deal with that. But don't ever think that you can throw a bunch of shit at me and expect that I'll eat it. You've got the wrong boy in this case. I respect and admire you greatly and hold our friendship in very high regard, but don't treat me as if I were a weaker animal because I will surprise you. Your work is yours, my work is mine. We need to remember that. Call or write or not. Yours in love and war. Thompson replied, quote, Cheer up. I was just answering your questions about the wardrobe. Your real fears are still to come. Just before the filming began, Terry Gilliam recorded the Depp voiceovers that would punctuate and guide the film. In the studio, listening to Depp speak, Gilliam was reminded of an earlier famous voiceover, Martin Sheen's in Apocalypse Now. Gilliam says, quote, It was like going upriver. We were off to war. Depp and Thompson were in constant telephone contact. Depp would call, requesting clarifications. How would he react to a certain thing? What would he think? Where would he sit in a bar? Depp told Rolling Stone, quote, I despise those prick actors who say, I was in character, and I became the character, and all that stuff. It's hideous. It's just masturbation at the highest level. But nonetheless, he continues saying, There was something that was stronger than me on this film. It was my experience of Hunter. Clearly, I'd spent too much time with him, and it had taken over. When the film was finished, and the director, cast, and crew felt really good about the work they had delivered, it was time to show it to Thompson. Depp says he was somewhat terrified of what Thompson might think. Private screenings were arranged, and invitations were dispatched. But at the last minute, Thompson kept failing to make them. 
turned out, he was as terrified as Depp was about seeing the film because he didn't want to be disappointed. But he finally saw it. And by the time the final credits rolled, Thompson wore an ear-to-ear -ear grin and seemed very happy with Depp as his on-screen avatar. Depp recalled the private premiere and said, quote, It was the moment of truth. They flew the film up to Aspen for Hunter to see, and I was scared to death because I really did believe that he would potentially hate me for the rest of his life. After he'd seen the film, I got him on the phone because I had to know. I said, Okay, do you hate me? Was I right? And he said, Oh, hell no, man. Christ, it was like an eerie trumpet call over a lost battlefield. Those words just came out of his mouth. I thought, well, okay, we're solid. After Thompson's death in 2005, Depp played a key role in organizing the memorial, an event that became known as the Blast Off which took place at Thompson's Owl Farm property in Colorado and included various rituals and activities, one of which involved firing Thompson's ashes out of a specially designed cannon. This act was meant to symbolize Thompson's spirit and his desire to go out in a grand and memorable fashion. Depp paid $3 million towards the cost of the operation. Bill Murray also attended, and he too contributed a significant sum towards fulfilling Thompson's final wishes. Depp says, quote, He'd drawn the funeral out to a degree that he'd almost picked the exact spot. I almost think Hunter left the cannon as a kind of pain medication. It allowed us all to go, Yeah, we're mourning Hunter, but we gotta put that on hold for a second because Jesus Christ, we've gotta build this 150-foot cannon to shoot him into the stratosphere. I think Hunter knew that I was the only one dumb enough to take it on. I didn't light it, but it was a beautiful and surreal ballet of lights and explosions. It was perfection. Imagine, Hunter Thompson ends his life as a combination of ashes and gunpowder in a giant bullet. It was pretty symmetrical. He continues saying, I feel him every single day. Literally, from the time I wake up and have coffee to when I plop my head down on the pillow. I'm haunted by him and I'm ecstatic for it. I was very fortunate back then to know that whatever was going on, whatever was happening with us, whatever we were doing, I knew it was really special, and I knew that was never going to happen again. I'm very lucky. Depp's dedication to capturing the essence of Thompson was evident from the moment he stepped into the character of Raoul Duke. Depp's ability to navigate the transparent line between comedy and tragedy brought to vivid life a character that is a complex blend of wit, intelligence, and self-destruction. And Depp managed to convey all these elements with remarkable nuance. He seamlessly transitioned between moments of hilarity and moments of introspection, capturing the internal turmoil and ongoing existential crisis that lurked beneath Thompson's flamboyant exterior. Depp's portrayal also showcased his acute sense of comedic timing. He masterfully delivered Thompson's rapid-fire monologues and offbeat observations, infusing them with the perfect blend of wit and absurdity. Depp's ability to traverse the film's altered states added an extra layer of authenticity to the character, as he embraced the chaos and madness of Thompson's drug-fueled adventures. Beyond the surface-level mannerisms and eccentricities, Depp managed to tap into the essence of Thompson's spirit captured Thompson's insatiable appetite for freedom and his unyielding commitment to speaking truth to power. Depp's performance portrayed Thompson as a man on a relentless quest for the American dream, even if it meant delving into the darkest corners of the human experience. Reflecting on the role and the friendship formed, Depp would say, quote, When you make the choice to play a living human being, there's a lot of responsibility, especially when you really care about them. You put so much of them into your system, it's like there's residue when you're done. It took me a while to stop being Hunter. I cursed him every day. I said, this guy got him under my skin, can't get rid of him. He's still there. I hate him for that. In the pantheon of great film performances, Depp's portrayal as Hunter S. Thompson in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas undoubtedly shines as a brilliant testament to his artistry. It is a performance that challenges the notion of what it means to truly inhabit a character, leaving an indelible mark on the world of cinema. His performance has become iconic, 
influencing countless actors and solidifying Thompson's legacy in popular culture. Depp's commitment and his unwavering dedication to bringing Thompson to life has made his portrayal the definitive representation of the legendary writer, ensuring that it will be remembered for generations to come.